Wait, what happened there? Okay, we ready to start? Okay, um, I was listening to um, a, a webcast yesterday. Great, I'm going to trip over that. And some of the ideas that they came up with, I'm going to try out with you, and I want your feedback to tell me whether or not they were helpful for today's lesson. So starting off with the first idea, is that clear yeah. enough for you guys to see? This is the learning intentions. This is what I'm hoping that you're going to learn today. So I'm hoping you're going to be able to identify the origins of the genre of the female reclining mood. So if you were away yesterday, you would not have heard this. So we're going to be new stuff for you, revision of yesterday for those girls who were here yesterday. Secondly, identify the reasons culturally why this genre began. Thirdly, identify the symbolism <coughs> that occurs across the genre. Fourthly, name a range of different artists from across different um, time periods that have responded to the reclining mood as a genre. Explain why they chose this genre and what does their work reveal about their conceptual practice. That's what I want you to be focusing on while I'm up here talking and asking you guys questions. When you do answer a question, can you just, for the sake of um, those who are not here and for yourself if you're revising speak loudly so that it can get picked up on the, um, on the computer. So how will you know if you have been successful um, today? <coughs> well it's hoped that by the end of this lesson you'll be able to identify the time in history that the reclining female mood began as a genre. Secondly you'll be able to identify the reasons culturally why it began. Thirdly, you'll be able to identify the name of the artist from the Renaissance that made this style of genre popular in the first place. List the symbolism in the artworks is the fourth. Fifth, list artists who have used this genre and the names of their artworks. And finally, identify these artists' conceptual choices for using this genre to communicate with their audiences. So that's what we're hoping to achieve by the end of this lesson. It's a lot because most of it we've already covered yesterday. So in keeping with what we actually went through yesterday, I'm going to quickly ask you a few questions to see how much of this you may already recall from yesterday's le uh, lesson. So can you identify, anybody in here, put your hand up for me, the origins of the genre of the reclining female mood? When did it start? Renaissance period? Sure, it was. Thank you, Trudy. It happened in the Renaissance. Okay, why did it happen? Is it because for the pleasure of the man's Yes, it does. The pleasure of the male gaze. Is that what you're trying to say? Yep, that's right. Who was it made for? Rich men. Rich men. So was these artworks of these reclining female nudes, which is essentially what they are, were they for public display or private display? Private. Private. They were very private. <coughs> okay. Um, culturally, it's what did they hide behind to make these images somewhat ex um, acceptable? Yeah. Mythological stories. Okay, so what did they call these reclining women? Venus. Venus, that's right. So culturally, they were not allowed to do something. So they hid behind mythology. What weren't they allowed to do? What was frowned upon? Sexuality. Sexuality, yeah, nudity. Good. These things were frowned upon. Something happens in the Renaissance, and we saw it with Michelangelo's David. What was he celebrating? The human body. The human body, in particular, Trinity, when you say the human body, what were they celebrating about the human body? Um, 
the beauty of it. And what else about the beauty? What did they notice about the beauty? The perfection. So we've got these mathematical precisions, and what did that reflect? Created the ideal form. Mm. And what, how does that link back to their religious beliefs? There's a big shift from um, the, the uh, early Christians, where celebrating the human form as a reflection of the creator. Of the creator. The power of the creator. He was, he being God, was this amazing creator and was ce <coughs> celebrating what he has created. We're no longer ashamed of who we are. But women being unclad was not acceptable unless she was a goddess. And then she wasn't. Therefore, unacceptable. Okay, is this helping? All right, so now we jump back to the, some of the imagery we were looking at yesterday from the, um, the website, and we're looking at number four, which is the reclining female nude. Now, this particular artwork here by Giorgione, what do you remember me saying about this particular painting? Uh, that was Venus of Urbino, so hang on to that thought, Sinead, because that's spot on, but not this particular artwork. It was the first female Thank you. Did you hear what Catalina just said? What did she say? First female This is the very first <coughs> example of the reclining female nude that occurs, and it's by Giorgione. But he is not the artist who made it popular. Who made it popular? Titian, with his artwork, The Venus of Urbino, which I don't have a copy of just here at the moment. Um, if we go back to the reclining nude here at Khan, uh, Khan Academy, we'll see Venus of Urbino here. We're not going to listen to it, but there's the image there of the Venus of Urbino. Now, we know from watching this video yesterday that there are specific things that take place on this video, which I'm not going to have any sound for it. Um, we'll just, background, so our eye moves down. We'll just pause it and go back to the full image. What are some of the symbolism that we can see in this artwork? And the reason why we're pointing that at this, this symbolism out, there is a reason for it. What did you notice yesterday that I kept showing you about the symbolism? We saw the dog. Where else did we see references to the dog? Appropriations of the artwork. We saw appropriations of this artwork. So we start to very quickly <coughs> need to recognise the original symbolism from these works from the Renaissance period because the symbolism that's contained within these works become very important as references for works that we start to look at in contemporary contexts. So what was the symbolism here? Does anyone remember? We have the dog. What was someone sort of mentioned the dog, Catalina? What was it? Oh, sorry, MJ, what did the dog refer to? Um, it represents loyalty. Loyalty? There was a particular word that I used yesterday. Do you remember what it was? Fidelity. Good. Fidelity. And fidelity in the really basic interpretation means that you're sworn to one person and one person only. That you are loyal, you are faithful, you are all those amazing things. And the dog often is a representation of that. Um, if I was to quickly jump, which I'm not going to do now, to um, the marriage of the, uh, I can't even think what their name is. Uh, there's a, a painting which I'll have to look for and show it to you. Uh, the marriage of the Arnolfini, you'll see that there's a little dog in the foreground in front of the husband and wife as they're in their, um, their marriage chamber. And the dog is there yet again, just a little toy dog, not a toy as in pretend, but small breed. It's there again as a reference to this idea 
that the Renaissance um, audience would have known of the fidelity of um, that dog and its symbolism. What else did we see here? The flower represents her youth. Okay, good. The flower represents her youth. What else do we see? The gaze. The gaze. This is a really important thing. What about the gaze? Um, she's connecting to her audience. Okay, she's looking directly out of her audience. And what kind of gaze does she have? Very sexual. Thank you, MJ. You're the only one who's brave enough to say it. She's got a very come hither look, doesn't she? She's very inviting. Um, is she aggressive or is she demure in the way that she's presenting herself? Demure. Yes, right. She's very demure. So she's available, but she's not aggressive. She is submissive in the way that she makes herself available. Now, these sorts of things become very important, as you already saw yesterday, as we move through history. Because the artists that we look at historically, who pick up on this genre, start to challenge some of these things. Quickly, what else can we see in this work? The tiles. The tiles in the background. Just what are they? Sorry? The luxury. Luxury. What else references luxury besides the tiles? The maids, the linen. the linen, the curtains. She's surrounded by rich, beautiful things. What does that mean? She's well looked after by either her father or her... Her lover. Yeah. In this case, it's her lover because she's there on display, not for a dad. Mm -hmm. I think dad would be upset if he saw this picture. Um, we've also got uh, her clad in jewellery. So we've got the beautiful earrings, the bracelet. And we've got a ring on her finger. There's one more thing that's really important. Where the placement of her hands. And it's not accidental that it's resting on, um, on, on her genitals. It's an invitation. Okay? It's also a way of you know, covering herself to an extent to make the whole experience more titillating for the audience member, being a male. But essentially, these things are tra uh, traditional references to the reclining nude. So if we go back to this image right back at the beginning of Giorgione, who starts the whole process, again, we see the hand is sitting in exactly the same place. The difference with this particular painting is what? Her eyes are closed. We start to see that that does not continue. So Giorgione very much has his mythological goddess in the landscape. She's the only one with her eyes closed. From then on in, we start to see these women who are very beautiful objects of desire because that's what they are. Um, and we have a whole variety. We have Venus of Urbino, which you've just seen uh, in the previous image. This one here is called... The Rogue Be Venus, thank you. And this one is a Spanish work by um, Velasquez. What's different about this particular work? We see her from behind. Are there any references to the other symbolism that we're seeing in Giorgione's Sleeping Venus or um, uh, uh, Venus of Urbino? Are there any connections between it? Sorry? That's right, she's looking out at her audience. But how is it done in this particular artwork? The reflection in the mirror. And more importantly, we can't actually see her face very well at all. We just get a sense that she's a very, very powerful woman in her sexuality, looking straight out at her audience. Oh, I miss the luscious skin. The luscious flesh, yes. And again, what else? There's one other thing. The luxury that surrounds her. She's, again, well looked after. We have this work here, again, by another Spanish artist, Goya. This is called the Nude Maja. Um, not much being held back here. She's, again, doing some of the things that we've seen that are traditional in the reclining nude. She's reclining, obviously. What else is she doing? She's very open. She's very open. 
her gaze at the audience is very challenging. We're starting to see a change happen here. This woman is not subdued at all. She's not submissive. But she's also not really aggressive. We talked about this particular work by uh, Angres called La Grande Odalisque. And this particular painting references the culture of the time. So we've moved into the early 1800s. Does anyone remember from yesterday what stories I told about this particular work? The spine was extended. So we're talking about the spine here being quite extended. But what was the conceptual inspiration for this kind of work? Bring it across the shoe. The no, the fan, you guys are picking up on stuff that's important, but it's not actually the story behind this work. What was, okay, let me. Uh huh. It was like, it was, it's like she's more designed because she's a white woman and the audience was for like, it's a like different audience. Is that the guy that had the mind? Yes. You're remembering the story. Okay, so this girl is presented to us, a Western audience, and remembering it's 1814 now, so this is going to be actually presented in public. So we've shifted from these artworks being shown only in private, in a man's chamber, his own personal rooms, into now being shown at the salon. So women are going to see these as well. But here we have a Venetian courtesan. Um, where we've got this beautiful woman who's obviously French, but she's surrounded by something from the exotic East. And what was happening in, um, in France at this time, as in Germany, as in Austria, as in, in England, was a lot of people were moving around and exploring you know, the historical places of the past. They were going to exotic locations, and one of them was Morocco. Now, in Morocco, as in other parts, it was run by um, the very wealthy um, sultans. And because of their religious and cultural backgrounds, there was none of these monogamous relationships, meaning one wife and that's it. They were, the wealthier you are, you were allowed to have as many wives as you were able to afford, and you were allowed to have concubines as well. Now, concubines are their own women as well, but they're just not um, high enough on the pecking order to be actually a wife. So here we have this woman who's surrounded again in luxury. We've got her with very exotic things that you would find in the East, like the turban she's wearing on her head, the fabric which is um, the, the curtain on the right-hand side, even the fan that she's holding very seductively in her right hand. Has, is peacock feathers, which is something that we would associate with India and the Far East. So it's suggesting that this woman, who's obviously French, is in a very exotic place. And it was made for a male audience, essentially, who would, I suppose, fantasise about what uh, this woman could make herself available to them to do. Okay? We've got all the other richness that you would normally see there. Now, the, the other side of this story is that um, when it was first shown, we've got the luxurious use of oil paints here to make the flesh incredibly luscious and beautiful that you've seen in previous examples. But um, he was extending the spine, which I think Catalina referred to. Now, there's no way her spine physically could be that long but it's an, another way of making her alluring, more seductive, more desirable, this beautiful, long, sweeping back. So he, he was aware that that's physically impossible, but the intention was to make this figure that much more desirable. Okay? Then we move into the mid-1800s with one of my favourite artists called Manet. Now, Manet is doing something deliberately antagonistic. Can we remember what this painting was playing with? The prostitute. Okay, so we've got a prostitute here. Is she just any ordinary kind of prostitute? She's like the, um, the, the, the one. 
Do you know what that was called? Um, I know it. Anyone help? No, it's a quarter zen. Yeah. Okay. So, what has he done here to reference this whole idea of the genre of the reclining mood? Do you want to like hide it anymore? Do you want to hide behind like the Venus thing? So he's just like going out there and showing it. So why was he going out there and and challenging his society? And what kinds of things has he done that has deliberately upset his audience? Okay, but he's called an Olympia. Because um, maybe has the emotions of goddess. Again, he's playing with this idea of she's a goddess. The gaze is challenging the audience. Yeah, the gaze is quite different. Now, if you go back through the list of images that we've already seen here, Georgiana's sleeping Venus got her eyes closed very much there to be looked at. Venus of Urbina, although she's looking at her audience, is very submissive. Then we move into um, the nude Marja. Uh, she's a little bit stronger as an individual, but it's all about her sexual prowess. Next. And then we've got the Rokeby Venus where we actually can't see her gaze, but we know that she's looking at us, looking at her. This one, as uh, Sinead said, she's a well-known prostitute of the time. And Manet has deliberately played with this whole history of hiding behind the presentation of nude female flesh by making it acceptable, by calling them something that connects to mythology. So he says, okay, we'll keep playing with this whole idea. We'll call it Olympia, but we know exactly who this woman is. She is so well known in, in Parisian society. So whoever came to the salon to see this, most of the male patrons who came and saw this painting would have recognized this woman. And if they hadn't had, had relationships with her, they would have desired to, or they would have passed judgment on the men who had. Now, with that sort of as the background, what symbolism can we see here that he is playing with? And what are the interpretations of them? The black cats. So it's a black cat instead of a dog. instead of a dog. A dog means fidelity. What does the black cat suggest? She owns herself. Dominance. She owns herself. What did I say yesterday about cats and dogs? Yeah, you can own a dog, but the cat owns you. You never own a cat. Everything's on the cat's own terms. So the choice of a black cat. We've also got references here to. You know, um, what other references to black cats? Evil? Bad luck? So what are the connotations that he's playing with in terms of choosing a black cat? We've got the idea that you can't own this woman. She's like a cat. She can't be tamed. She could be wild in bed. Can you see the connotations that he's playing with? These are the kinds of things you've got to drum up laterally when you're looking at artworks. What else could a cat mean? We said superstition, possibly. So again, she's bewitching. Can you see the connections? What else do we see here that we can relate to previous examples in this genre? The flowers. The flowers. The flowers where? Um, in the in her hair and what does that refer to yeah and what kind of flower is it it's a hibiscus what does a hibiscus do it opens right up and the flower also has a lot of sexual connotations as well okay I won't spell them out for you I think that you can use your own discretion there Anything else in this image that you can relate to? Venus of Urbino, Sleeping Venus by Giorgione. The maid. The witch? The maid. The maid. We've got a maid here attending her. Anything else? She's style of painting. It's not as um, trendy. 
Okay, there's been a big shift in the paint application style here. He's no longer interested in trying to create this luscious flesh. He's actually moving in what ends up becoming uh, a very modernist approach to applying paint. We've almost got a black outline on her figure and the, the application of where the highlights fall on the flesh are quite stark and unblended in comparison to the chocolate box look that we see with other examples. Anything else? The placement of the hand. Again, referencing Venus of Urbino in particular. And of course, the luxurious bed that she's draped across yet again. He is not trying to hide from the fact that he is deliberately referencing or recontextualizing a work from the past. But he has a particular reason for doing it, and that is to upset the status quo of the French establishment about how they hide behind um, their rules and regulations that allows them to uh, be involved with these women and still appear to be upright and moral individuals. And he's basically calling it for what it is. Is this the fact that the, um, the maid is like dark skin or anything to do with it? Yes. So I'm wondering whether anyone's going to pick up on that. So the fact that she's got black skin, what does that say? What could it be referencing? Think about the time in history. Slavery. We've got a huge slave trade that's happening. So where do you think Manet fits in terms of his own opinions about slavery and slave trade? He could possibly be against it. But he's definitely making reference because why would we see a black woman in a painting like this? Possibly. There's a lot of references here that you could play out. But it's not an accident that he's chosen to paint her black. Okay? All right, let me move into this wonderful artwork here by Yasumasa Morimura called Futago. And it's painted in 1988. Well, that's actually not a painting. It's a, it's a photograph with a painted backdrop. Now, what did we actually notice about the references to the genre here? Which artwork is it closer to that you've seen in the selection that we've looked at so far today? It's closest to, who painted Olympia? Mene. It's closer to Mene's Olympia. So this artist is doing something in terms of postmodernism. What is he doing specifically? Give me the, the name. He's appropriating it for a particular reason. Thank you. He's recontextualizing. So when an artist recontextualizes and appropriates an artwork, why do they do that? What do they need from you as the audience? To already understand the original artwork. Thank you. They need the audience to already recognize and understand something about the original artworks. So you guys, even in this brief lesson, have already started to um, collect a bunch of information about the genre of the reclining nude. That if I was to ask you to start to tell me about this artwork, you probably could. So let's try. So I'm going to just stop the, the tape for a moment and I'm going to get you to talk to your friends and I'm going to get you just to jot down some ideas about what the interpretation is of this artwork and how the symbolism has been used to support that. All right? Go for it. 